before we jump in though, I just want to say thanks to everyone that's checking the channel out. If you like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to subscribe, share, like on the YouTube channel or the podcast. And we did just launch a Patreon. So if you want to support us to help grow the scene a little bit, we'll do whatever we can for the community. Heyo, welcome everyone to episode 45 of Today in the Scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to talk about conventions. We've talked about conventions in the past, but we haven't really spoken with anybody other than at 2DCon um, what it takes to run a convention. Um, So this week we're going to talk about a convention that is very dear to my heart, um, just because it was one that I really got deep into the indie scene with, and that's Midwest Gaming Classics. So I'm joined this week by co-founder Dan. How are you doing today, Dan? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm I'm really excited to finally talk to you because I know we've we've spoken at the convention, but you're always just running around. There's so much going on. Uh, it's nice to like have a minute to chat. Yeah, at the convention, it's always a. Um, I I don't really remember conversations that I have much at the show because most of what I'm actually doing, and it's kind of funny. Uh, most of what I'm doing is putting, as we call it, fires out behind the scenes, so that we can make sure that everything's running smoothly, and you don't know what's gone wrong with the show. And as long as I'm the only one that knows what's going wrong with the show, we're in good shape. Yeah, I mean, that's I I can't even believe how many things happen when you have hundreds of people and thousands of games and just all that stuff is going on at the same time. Um, I guess first off, just introduce yourself. Let us know a little bit about who Dan is and kind of what you do. Sure. My name is Dan Lucen. And um, (laughs) am I on video? You are on video. Okay, perfect. Because uh, then I will introduce myself by saying I was the September 1999 Chuck E. Cheese team member of the year, or sorry, team <laughs> member of the month, star, star cast member, and therefore I decided that I should run a convention. That's not actually how it worked. Um, I just happened to have that sitting here, so why not? Uh, my actual background is that Gary and I have been gamers for uh, life. We've known each other for a long time. Gary is the other co-founder of the show, as well as there being literally about a thousand volunteers that help with the show. And um, we have always enjoyed doing stuff together. And we very early on said, hey, we'd like to start a game company together. And so our original goal was to run a game company. And um, when we, when, after we started that, we went to a convention called the Atari Jaguar Festival. And we had a lot of fun. And Jaguar Festival was unique because it was a traveling show. So in 1999, we went to it in Rochester, Minnesota. In the year 2000, I forget where it was. I think it might have been in New York or something like that. In 2001, Gary and I said, hey, we'd be happy to host this. And so we had um, the community said, like, yeah, you know what? No one else is stepping up to host this this year. We'd love to have you host it. And so we hosted it in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We drew around 100 people to, um, I actually have it sitting here right now, to JAGFest. See, you sometimes you get the props. I, I didn't actually set up the props today, but here we go. This is an original <laughs> JAGFest 2K1 shirt. Um, and uh, we, wow, this is my size. Um, we uh, we set up the show and we held it and we held, we drew about 100 people. And what was really unique about the JAGFest show or Atari Jaguar Festival, as it sounds a little bit more appropriate to say, um, was that it was a show that really drew a community together. So the Atari Jaguar as a console was not the most popular console in the world, believe it or not. And so um, it was one of the first consoles that really drew a kind of like grassroots little community around it that just loved it and it wasn't many people but there was a couple hundred of us that would interact on this message board and so jagfest was a way that we could get together in the real world and have fun and so when gary and i hosted it we said we want to expand this a little bit and you know get to meet other people and what was great was that we attracted some people from around town who had seen flyers for it and said i want to show up and see what this atari jaguar festival is because you can't put jagfest on flyer um and we also had people from all over the country and world actually come in for this, including three people from Japan who came to the show. And we had so much fun holding it. Gary and I were like, this was great. Um, we were the only people that had done the show that year. So we said, you know what, we're, we're going to put this out there for the community. We loved running this. If you would like us to run it again, we'd be happy to. Otherwise, this was so much fun. We're going to run our own thing next year. And um, the community decided that they wanted to keep the, the show moving, which was great. And uh, we held a contest to name the show. And uh, Ben Heckendorn, now known as Ben Heck, um, one of the 
internet famous hackers, if you will, uh, before he was famous, I uh, suggested the name Midwest Classic, which is what we did for two years before we added the word gaming to uh, try to better inform people as what it was, because Midwest Classic was like a basketball and soccer tournament that was also in the area. And um, we didn't want to field any more emails about like, when is the basketball tournament happening? And we'd be like, I have no idea. So now we're the Midwest Gaming Classic, which we sometimes get casino emails and because there's some Midwest gaming casino. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been kind of going on ever since. And basically we took the same concept of taking Jagfest where we had a community come together and we've basically said to every community, if you want to have this as a home, we want to show you guys off. We don't just want the show to be the Sega show. We want the show to be the show where if you know and seg is a bad example but let's say the microsoft show we don't want this to be the show where we just bend over backwards to have microsoft in we want this to be a show where if microsoft wants to come in great but we want them to be on an even level with the independents that are making a game for steam or something like that and to be able to show everybody more or less um two people at the same rate um gary and i do i have it sitting around here i don't know where it is we started by making these I wish I could hold one up to show it. I'm, I'm out of props, apparently. <laughs> um, but we started by making these crummy Atari Jaguar joysticks. Um, and, like, they were fine, but they weren't anything special. But we were really passionate about the project, and we really enjoyed making it. And so we we lived for, like, Jagfest where we could show off our joystick and have people play it and see our passion. And so that's what it's all about to us is finding ways that we can get people to share in that passion. And what's nice about the show now is that last time that we held it 2019 because of COVID, um, we drew about 15,000 people. And at this point, we, it's not just the little companies that bring, you know, joysticks that they've made in their basement with a drill, like Gary and I did. We have some of that. We also have the big companies. So, you know, on the arcade side of it, we've had raw thrills has been a big supporter of the show and Stern Pinball and all the pinball companies and stuff like that. But we still take the time to make sure that we can have space for everybody to come in and show off what they've got, because that's to us kind of the key to it all. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're, I, I feel like you just like ran through the convention, like all the feelings that I have about the convention were definitely there. And what you said, the, the passion and the love for it and the, the homemade stuff, but you're so right about the balance. Like, Stern is in there. Stern is a huge name. And then we're in there and, you know, it's, we, we just made this game. We didn't even know there were anybody else making arcade games. And right. we felt like we were right on that same level. So tell me a little bit about how the convention has progressed from 2001 to now. Um, so there, I, I reference, and I wish that I had pulled up the quote beforehand because I will often actually quote it. I referenced the Muppet movie whenever I talk about the convention, because in it, when Kermit gets to the end and he talks about going to Hollywood and he was going to become a performer and he talks about how he met all these friends along the way and he kind of took them for the ride with them. And now it's better because they're all a family. That's legitimately what I feel like the show is, is that there's all these different groups. And so like the indie arcade guys like yourselves, we... I see you guys as friends and I'm like, oh my gosh, here's my friends. And then I walk to the guys that help run the pinball arcade room. I'm like, oh, look, here's all my friends. And then I talk to the guys that helped bring in the Stern games. I'm like, oh, look, my friends. And then I go and I hang out like um, a couple of times during COVID. The guys that run the Nintendo age room have uh, come to me and been like, oh, hey, let's hang out on, on um, Zoom this week. I'm like, OK. And it's like it's amazing because it's like we have all these different friends that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to interact with in the same way. and that's a huge part of it for us is that like, I mean, l let's be real. There's a business here too. We're entertaining 15,000 people. Our budget that our expenditure budget is over $300,000. We can't run a non-professional show, but at the same time, um, it's, it's really key for us to be able to bring in those different groups and show all that stuff because that's where the real excitement is. Like, um, don't get me wrong. What Nintendo does, for instance, with the switch is very exciting. But Nintendo is going to get that sort of excitement no matter how they do it. Whereas a lot of smaller groups, we can give them a platform to share their excitement in a way that they otherwise couldn't. Um, so w one of the jokes I was telling you about this right before the show, um, or right before we started, was that uh, there's two of us that are co-founders, really. It's myself and Gary, and then there's tons of volunteers. And I tend to be the face of the show because the rule of thumb is, is that 
Uh, Gary is the one who is behind the scenes. He makes all the money. Nobody actually cares to call Gary up and be like, excuse me, how have you set up the ticketing this year to make it work? I bet that that is fascinating because it's just not. Whereas they're like, ooh, who's coming in this year? And that's me because I'm the one that figures out how we spend the money. Um, and for me, at least, the the uniqueness about the show is being able to give that platform to people to make sure that we can do that and doing it in a professional way that other shows just quite frankly don't do. I have no idea if I even answered the right question there, but I kind of went everywhere. So I hope that that was good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was fine. I mean, I, you, you're right. I mean, it is, it is a very, very professionally run show and it, it feels like a major convention. Like when you go in there, it feels huge, but it also feels small like it, it feels really like community based and very close knit um and you know everybody feels welcome in in my eyes like i i didn't know a lot about arcades when i got there but i got to play and everybody was like yeah you ever played this check this out kind of thing yeah. and it was fun especially meeting all the indie guys so give me kind of the rundown of how you guys got involved with the indie scene what were some of the first games you saw and what did you do to bring them in how did you get in touch with them um, so a lot of what ends up happening with communities is not necessarily me going out anymore. It's more them coming to me. And so this just basically comes down to a, an effective size, right? When we were very small, when we were Atari Jaguar Festival, there was a lot of Dan Lucen going to a store and saying, would you please come to my show? And them going, I've never heard of your show. What is this? And me going, let me describe it to you. And them going, man, you had a hundred people. I probably won't go. Now that we have 15,000 people, there's a lot more chances that someone shows up and goes, oh my gosh, I've got an idea. And we always tell everybody, tell other people that may be interested to contact us because I, I always say, Gary and I are really bad at saying no to people. There's pretty much no one who has contacted us with a legit thing that Gary and I have gone, no, we, we don't want you here. That doesn't happen. And so a lot of it... Um, uh, I think that the first one that we actually did was Cosmotrons. Um, and so if you, I, I believe that you've talked with um, those guys before, but um, in yeah. short, the Cosmotron story is that they asked if they could come show a show or sorry, show a game at our show. They um, had been in the area and they wanted to just kind of show it. And I was like, yeah, let's give you space. Let's find out what you can do. And I set them up with that. And they were like, oh, this is great. And they loved it. And they said, we're going to try making a cabinet now. And when they made the cabinet, they came back with the intention only of making it into a Steam game. And they had people that weekend coming up to them and saying, how can I purchase this? And they were going, we didn't expect that that would happen. <laughs> and so basically, thanks in large part to Midwest Gaming Classic, they said, we're going to actually bring this to production. And so once that happened, I think that other indie people saw the... Saw the um, the progression of that, saw the news of that, saw people covering, oh, this happened at the Midwest Gaming Classic. And so they, you know, contacted me or contacted them and said, who do I contact and got in touch with me? And like I said, I, I don't say no. Um, like it's, we, I should put it as there are times that we can't pull off stuff to be clear. But for the most part, if someone comes in with a good idea, we're always willing to say, all right, well, how can we do this and how can we work with this? And then the other thing is that Gary and I are fiercely loyal to the people that have uh, brought us to the dance, so to speak. And so if it's a group that came in that has been good in the past, we're not going to be like, all right, well, you were really good last year. Now we want you to do something completely different. Um, and as long as we have that, then it just keeps growing because by word of mouth. So like, for instance, then you meet more people with your game and then they talk with you and then you're like, you know, what's a good place to go to, you know, where you can get put at the same basic rate as raw thrills. And by the way, raw thrills is not angry about that at all. Raw thrills is excited about seeing the new people. Um, if you have not ran into Eugene Jarvis, for instance, at the show, yep, he will we played with him a couple up. times. Yeah. And he'll walk up and he'll play other games and he'll tell you like, this is great and stuff like that. Um, and this is what I would do differently. And what have you thought about this? And like, He's more than willing to do this. Um, and it's exciting because like, so the big arcade show for whatever reason, and by the way, my background is I used to work for, I did a whole bunch of different jobs, but the one that plays the most with how Midwest Gaming Classic is run is I used to work for Six Flags. And so okay. I know a little bit about what I'm about to mention from that side of it. And by the way, when I say that, I mean, as an executive, not just as a monkey who pressed buttons on the rides to make them go, although I also did that. Um, but um, the... 
amusement industry for the most part uses IAPA as their home, like, this is the big show that we need to debut stuff at. And it doesn't make any sense because IAPA is a show that's not really open to the general public and you get only the people in the industry going through. And like, if I have a game, um, I have, we'll pretend that that's uh, the new pinball machine, uh, Fortnite, Fortnite, the pinball machine behind me, right? And if I put that out at IAPA, the people that are going to go and play that are 100% not the same people that are going to play that in the real world. And so the data that you get from looking at a game like that in IAPA, in my estimation, is far different than the data that you would get putting that pinball machine out at our show. And so there's a huge difference. But right now, a lot of the old school industry still uses IAPA as like, that's the show we have to go to. And they are starting to, I behind the scenes, I've had conversations with more than one arcade manufacturer who shall not be named, um, and I'm not talking about Raw Thrills here, um, that have said, like, we want to actually get out of the IAPA thing and do more shows like you guys, because it makes sense for what we're seeing, what we're doing, and the markets that we're trying to penetrate. It's just that there's this belief still with the ownership group that IAPA is where we have to go to. And so for us, it's important to put everybody, though, on the same level as much as possible. And so, like, the difference would be if you, for instance, decided, hey, we're going to bring three games, and Raw Thrill says, hey, we're going to bring 20 games, we're going to say yes to all 23 of them. And so that's like where the difference is, but we don't want the difference to be in a thing of like us going, well, you know, we want you to pay us $5,000 per game that you're bringing. And I don't know that that's what IAP is at, but I would be surprised if they're not. And that to me is, um, there's a gatekeeping there that's unfortunate. And I can actually say something to that on the extent of, uh, we had once talked with a large gaming company who had said that they would be interested in coming in, but we would have to pay them. Uh, it was something like 25% of our gate and give them 25,000 square feet. And it was just like, no, we're not. Wow. Nobody. Yeah. And it's like, no, nobody is that special. We're not giving anybody a percentage of the gate because <laughs> we don't make enough money as it is. We, we, for the longest time, have just barely been above break even. And now with COVID and loans and stuff like that, it's, you know, potentially even more problematic. But um, doing stuff like that allows us to, saying no to those types of things allows the show to grow in an organic method of how things really work. And the flip side of that is that um, Nintendo, actually, and I love pointing this one out, Nintendo, who is not necessarily known as a company that, you know, often goes out and just does smaller things. We have local sales rep with Nintendo who have convinced Nintendo that this is a show that they should be part of. So Nintendo's actually been at our show for like the last five years, but they purposely go into a room with another arcade, Star Worlds Arcade, and they present themselves as the second fiddle in that room. And they do that very specifically as we want to be part of the community, not taking over the community. So it's always Star Wars World's Arcade featuring Nintendo. And so Nintendo will have some games on demo there. And it's not overwhelming. It's not massive. But they have, you know, you can gather in that room then. And there's a chance for you to play the stuff. And you can, you know, there's the arcade there too. And so they're part of the community and they get it. And that's what we want everybody that's part of our show to get is that, look, this is a community of gamers and we want you to come together as a community. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the truth. And I've, I've checked out that room and you guys have other rooms. And I think, I want to say you were holding like uh, some kind of uh, air hockey national tournament or something yep. there the last time I was there. Yep. There's There's so much going on and it's such a cool space that like, Really, anybody that's interested in anything kind of gaming entertainment can get joy out of this, especially the people that love retro games. Like, tell me a little bit more about how you guys go and show the history of gaming and its evolution, because you have a huge chunk of all these classic games that, I mean, a lot of them, me being in my late 20s, I had never even heard of when I yeah, went there. Yeah. Um... Well, and part of this, too, is that we specifically have targeted some of the stuff that people would not have ever heard of because we want to give people experiences that are new. Um, there's this area called the museum, and the museum really started kind of in 2001, kind of in 2002. So that's how far it goes back. Um, in 2001, we worked with a guy named Marty Goldberg. Marty came in and he said, I have all this cool Atari stuff. How about for Atari Jaguar Festival, I bring in the 2600 and the 5200 and the 7800 so that people can see like that progression. And Marty, by the way, is an Atari historian who's actually written one of the defining books on the history of Atari. Um, 
Atari business is fun. And he still runs that section of the museum. So he runs essentially everything that's Nintendo and earlier, or I should say earlier than Nintendo. And so it's like a lot of the early Atari computers and Amiga computers and Commodores and all of the early systems and stuff like that. And so they, they he works with probably 10 or 15 people that are really into that side of it. And they work together and bring in the stuff and they bring in, they set up, you know, 25, 30 tables worth of stuff. On the flip side, that first year, we had a guy come to the show who loved it. And when he heard that we were doing it a second time, he said, I'd like to become part of this. His name is JD Norman. And JD said to me, hey, you know, I would love to bring some of my newer stuff and we can have a newer section. And so he started running that. And at this point, the newer section team is probably 25 to 30 people big. And so they bring in a ton of that stuff. That team talks regularly. Um, there's like, it's, it's interesting. I won't share personal business, but I will say that someone in that group just had something very important in their life happen. And it was cute because the entire group came together to like, give them a gift and like wish them congratulations and stuff like that. And, um, it's just really cute how those communities have grown. And so like, some of it is definitely what we do. Um, I'll tell you right now, this is actually kind of, I'm, I'm excited about this. So I have all of these arcade boards, um, around me right now. This is Mario Brothers from Nintendo. Uh, over here is, I think this is New Zero Team. Um, I've got literally 25 of those around me right now because one of the things that we've had an issue with is showing some of the older arcade games. And so we said, well, how can we solve this? And so one of the things that we've been working on for a couple of years now is that we wanted to create our own arcade games that we could bring in. So right now I'm working with a team of about six people and. Um, we have uh, been going back and forth with design plans for our own uh, arcade cabinets that will look relatively normal, except that they'll secretly be very skinny so that we can transport them and store them easier. And that way we're going to be able to show some of the history of the arcade game. So we'll have, for instance, like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles will be able to show up at the show and be there. Whereas in the past, it's very hard to get someone to bring in original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and set it up for the show because original arcade games in particular are so big and cumbersome. Um, I've worked for a number of arcades. The Chuck E. Cheese thing was legit. I also worked for a FEC. I worked for Six Flags, which had uh, a ton of arcade machines at the time. Um, I worked for, uh, I mean, I worked for Mills Gaming Classic. I have, uh, I still repair pinball machines on, well, I theoretically, when there's not COVID, repair pinball machines on route for two different locations. Um, who knows if any, I'll repair machines for any locations when this is over. But, um, you know, that's that's part of it. And so finding the people to do that and help present these different pieces of it are very important. And then at the same time, uh, we've had other groups come in. So, for instance, like I said, this, they, and they're not the Nintendo Age group anymore, but in my mind, that's what they are because that's what they started at. It was a group of people from Nintendo Age that got together that said, ooh, we want to go even deeper. And so they present a, they present a room full of Nintendo stuff that's more about the community that's doing the new games for the Nintendo and stuff like that. And like I said, it's just we're, we're bad at saying no. So, like, I don't know, 10 years ago, we had someone come to us and they were like, why don't you guys have tabletop games? And we were like, yeah, why don't we? And they were like, cool, can I bring tabletop games? And we were like, yeah, cool, what do you need? And we've been doing tabletop games, and now we're one of the biggest tabletop games uh, places in the state too. And so we just, we keep bolting things on like that, and um, it's good. And so, yeah, I guess it, this, is the, <laughs> this is the thing to take away from this, I guess, is that if you're interested in helping with the Midwest Gaming Classic, uh, go to any Midwest Gaming Classic page, go to the bottom, and contact us. And we'll ask questions back and forth with you to figure out what makes sense. But for the most part, what what I'm going to be asking you is, what is it that you want to do? Some people will come to me and they'll be like, well, what should I do? And I'm always like, I don't know. Because if I tell you what Dan Lucen's passion is, and you are there trying to make my passion into what you're doing, you're going to come off as being fake. And you're going to have this issue that the people who are coming up to you and like asking you questions are going to be able to tell that you don't actually have the passion for it. Whereas if you show up and you're like, you know, hey, I don't know, I'm really into, I'm really into, look, I got another prop. I'm really into the game Coaster from uh, Disney Interactive from like the early 90s. And I want to play this game and show this to people. If I'm there and going, oh my God, have you seen this game? It's amazing. You're actually going to be like, I've never heard of that, but that dude clearly is interested in it. So I'm going to stop over there and see it. Whereas if instead I'm like, hey, I want to show, you know, Dan Lucen said that, you know, Coaster wouldn't do that well. I should instead show them 
you know, Dungeons and Dragons, and then they show up, and I'm like, yeah, this is Dungeons and Dragons, you know, I, some people like this. No one's going to care. And so that's really what the show's been built on kind of the whole way. And so, yeah, um, like I said, if anybody's listening and you're like, ooh, this sounds great, um, and you've got an idea, especially of something that you do yourself, shoot us an email and we'll see what we can do. We can't always work with everybody um, because some people have demands that quite frankly, we can't meet, but then I'm usually pretty willing to say, well, this is what we can't do. And here's why. Yeah. I mean, you've been super receptive to us and I'm sure the other indie, all the other indie guys said reaching out to you was super easy and you guys were super accommodating and it made it a ton of fun, like to really be there and what you were saying with the passion, like, everybody was doing what they wanted to do, how they wanted to do it. And you were just helping facilitate that for everyone. And it, yeah. it went really, really well. Yeah. Well, and I will say that the, the way that I see my role more than anything else is like, the only thing that I do is that I figure out how to make sure that everybody's ego is happy because what people don't want to have, and by the way, they're correct. I'm not saying that anybody is incorrect in this, but what you don't want to have is that like, let's say that you emailed me and I'm like, yes, you can totally come. And I'm like, I'm putting you in the back of the hall. I'm putting you where no one can see you. I'm putting you in a place that nobody goes to. And right in front of you, I'm going to put raw thrills with giant banners. And I'm going to make sure that everybody sees them and no one has any idea who you are. At that point, you would be like, what the heck? And now there is some differences. If raw thrills is going to shoot me money as a sponsorship, there is stuff that I will do differently for them. But then I will talk to you to see what we can do and like figure that out because ultimately then you'll also understand like, hey, this is what we're doing and I'm not going to stick you in the back. I'm still going to do my best and I'm going to tell you how I'm doing my best. And there are times, and this is always important, I think, when running a show, there are times that I even tell people, I don't know how this is going to work, but we're going to find out together. And then that way too, if something doesn't work, then me and you or anybody get together the next year and we're like, okay, so this didn't really work. What can we change? What can we do? And the people that are open to that sort of um, flexibility find the Midwest Gaming Classic to be an incredible venue. And quite frankly, it's the only reason that we do it. Um, I'm not I, I look at, all right, so real quick aside, but it's an important history of the show thing. Up until 2004, most of the show was really organized by Gary and me very directly. We were figuring out this is the museum and we had our fingers in like, these are the games that we want in the museum. These are the arcade games that are coming. These are the tournaments that we are going to run. And Dan is figuring out all the games that are going to be on tournaments and stuff like that. Um, 2003 sucked. We lost like $5,000. Um, there was a point in 2003 that I literally took money and was throwing it in the air and saying, this is how good classified ads are because nobody showed up from them. We had told everybody that was coming that we would have at least a thousand people at the show. We had 206, which is seared into my memory banks. Uh, we gave away an arcade game at $5 a person. It was almost, it was about half of them. Half of the money went straight to covering the arcade game. The other half went to one third of our venue costs. We went back to all of the like vendors and stuff like that and refunded their money because we were like we told you a thousand people it didn't happen so the next year in 2004 we said we're going to go bigger go home we worked with a hotel that flat out screwed us um and gary and i had been working our regular jobs and putting in 40 to 60 hours a week of time planning the show and then the thing like the hotel came to us and had lied about some certain things and I'll, I'll leave that as water under the bridge but i will simply say that afterwards i was like well you know what at least when i go home and look online people are going to be like hey this was a good show and so i went home that night and i was like i lost a bunch of money again but at least now next year i think that we'll be able to do this better and when i got home and i sat down at the computer it was like I went to the Midwest Gaming Classic, and I own every Nintendo game except for two, and neither of those two games were there, so the show was a disaster, and I wouldn't go. And at that point, I threw up my hands, and I said to Gary, I am done. This is stupid. We're not doing this anymore. Um, but for anybody that doesn't know, we also run a, a online, re bleh, online retro game store called Goat Store. And so um, we were still doing that, and Goat Store, by the way, subsidized thousands of dollars of Midwest Gaming Classic losses for many years. Um, Goat Store was still doing its thing. And so um, we started to have people the next year start contacting us and saying, hey, what happened to the Midwest Gaming Classic? I loved that show. And we couldn't just say, you were wrong. That show sucked. We're not doing it again. Because we were like, if we do that, they're not going to buy video games from Goat Store and we want them to do that. And so instead, we were like, 
Well, I tell you what, let's tell them that there were some major issues with it. Let's be pretty honest about it. And then let's come up with a list of impossible challenges that we will run the show again if they meet. And so we said things like, hey, um, we want to find a venue that's twice as big, but for half the cost. And we're like, yeah, there's no way they'll get that. And then we said, we want to find someone who will sit at the ticket booth all day and manage tickets. Because one of the issues was Gary and I had to be at tickets before this point. And so like, if there was a problem, one of us was there 24 seven and could not leave to actually solve the problem or else you'd let everybody in for free, which was another problem, um, especially when you're losing money. Um, and so we also said, oh, we need someone to manage all of our like flyering throughout town. And we need to make sure that we have at least 50 places with our flyers. We're like, no one's going to do that. And what was shocking. So we had probably about a dozen people that had emailed us. So I put them all on an email, CC'd them all and said, hey, here's what we need. This is what it is. And we sent that email out. And what I did not know happened is that they took me and Gary off of it and they started bouncing the email around between them. They divided up the tasks. And um, about two weeks later, I got, an e I got an email back that said, hey, we found a place that's twice as big for a quarter of the cost. Here's who's going to manage the, uh, this. Here's the team that's going to do tickets. Here's the, and it was like, I remember looking at Gary and being like, oh crap, I think we got to run the show again. And he was like, yeah. And so we made the rule, which was if we ever lose money again, we're going to and we're going to not run this. And then we went on an amazing streak from 2006 to about 2015, where we never made more than two hundred dollars, but we never lost money, which when you think about it, it is always crazy because we were charging at one point twenty five dollars a ticket, which meant that we were within eight people of losing money more than one year. And we were just that close. And it was always like, OK, this is what it is. And like, um, we, so we kept doing that and doing that, but what happened, what, what, and the reason that I bring this up is that what really happened with that is that it proved to me two things. Number one, nobody comes to the Midwest Gaming Classic because of Dan Lucent. You come to the Midwest Gaming Classic because Dan Lucent can organize you into a place, but like people come to the Midwest Gaming Classic to see Galactic Battlegrounds. They come to the Midwest Gaming Classic to see Raw Thrills. They come to the Midwest Gaming Classic to see Stern. They come to the Midwest Gaming Classic to play pinball. They come to the Midwest Gaming Classic to play video games. They do not come to stare at me. And that's really important. There's no like, oh, I'm so great. And that's why people come to the show. And um, I've, I've consulted with a number of other show organizers. And that's one of the things that I always try to put into them because a lot of other shows are like, well, they let me tell you about why my show is great. In 1978, I bought my first pinball machine. And it's like, nobody cares. I do not care about your gaming history. I care about the collective, the community's gaming history. And so at least that's my belief. Maybe someone cares about my history in 1978. I wasn't born. So if you do, cool. Um, but that side of it, I think, is really important. And so knowing that, I know that the reason that people are coming is because people like you are willing to come to the show and to have a passion about something and to show that passion. And what I always point out that's amazing is that the people that saved the show for real in 2005, um, the, the team of people, it was a man and a woman who did tickets together, are now married. Um, they still come to the show every year and help with the show every year. Um, the guy who found the venue for us, that's actually JD. He still runs the museum to this date. Um, the people who did the promotions for us still help us with promotions, still help us do stuff. Um, every time we basically have never lost a volunteer and that's amazing and like the other side of it that i always think is amazing is that um a perfect for instance is that we've worked with i, I now have three people that were sales people for me that are now on staff of the show because i ended up liking the show so much that they were like you know what this is such a blast i no longer work with the company that you work with but can i come help you anyway and it's like really like, and those are the ones that are always so touching to me. Um, we had a manager that used to work at the Sheraton reach out to me uh, after we moved. And he said, you know, hey, I'm not there anymore. But, you know, if you need anything, tell me what it is. I'd be happy to come in and take tickets for you for a day or something like that. It was just like, okay. And so that's that to me is the real magic of the show is that you have all of these people who really understand, like, it's not about one individual, it's about the collective group. And then what really is the star of the show is that passion that you have for it. And so my passion is finding people that have passion and putting them together and making sure that they're all comfortable with their spot because you know the, everybody's passion is legit, everybody's passion has meaning and nobody wants to hear that, well, that person's, 
as I point to Skeletar, uh, that person's passion is more important than yours. And so I, I feel like that's probably the driving point of it is that we have to make sure that that's all balanced and in flux. And then it just kind of keeps going. And, you know, that, like I said, and that the real heart of the show is 100% not me or Gary. It's you. It's people that buy tickets because that allows us to bring, like, get money. It's people that come to me with ideas and say, hey, what about this? Um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick one more story off of this. Sorry, I, I get going when I get about passionate people because it's the thing that I just, like, it's so cool what people do. Um, but, like, I will tell you, um, we have a guest who I have confirmed for this year's show. They are unannounced right now. But a lot of the times when you deal with guests for a show, you end up having to deal with managers and stuff like that. And so this particular guest, I shot who I thought was his manager an email. And they emailed me back, or they, I'm sorry, they did not email me back. I put in the email, you know, here's my, my phone number. If you want to, you can text me or you can call too. Not even 10 minutes later, the actual person is texting me. I'm like, whoa, okay. And so we start going back and forth and they are saying like, I have this idea. What about doing this? And what about doing that? And what about doing this? And that's what I love is that you can get these people that have this to come in. And when you can find that unique niche, that's what makes the show really special. And so like, um, what, one last story that I can say about like last year or two years ago, for instance, that was really unique is that I was talking with Ted DiBiase, the million dollar man from the WWF in the mid eighties. And it was fascinating because I was having this conversation with Ted and saying like, yeah, I think, I think you'd be a really good fit. And he was like, Dan, I've got to stop you because I'm going to be honest here. It's like, I didn't play any of the games with me in it. And I said, Ted, that makes total sense. If my job is wrestling, the last thing that I want to do is go home and do my job, but in a game for the rest of the night. I said, all that I want you to do is be honest about that. And um, so we actually put together a presentation with Ted DiBiase watching a lot of his appearances in many of his in many of the video games that the Million Dollar Man was featured in for the first time in many cases. And so figuring out stuff like that, that we could do that was, that's unique is like the key to the show. What can we do that's special? Yeah. I mean, like the more you talk about passion and all this, it just like, it really clicks. The community is such a big part of the show and you can feel it. That's why I said, it feels like it's a big show, but it feels like a small community. And yeah. the show was what really drove me into the indie community, which then, turned me into doing this outside of making the video game with everybody that I make it with. And that's why I love going back every single year because it just feels like the community gets bigger and you run into people that you met the last year. And it's like you, everybody remembers what happened last year and the, the after party is super fun too. I had a blast at that. Um, but it just like, I'm all riled up about it now too, because it is so fun and there's so much community and so much passion, like everywhere you go, everybody is loving what they're doing. Um, right. I guess I know we're, we're getting kind of close on time here. So I'm going to ask you a question that I, as someone who has never run a convention, but has attended a handful of them. And you mentioned kind of before all the dumpster fires. What is one of the worst dumpster fires you've had to put out during a show? Ah, uh, oh, there's so many. Um, I'll 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 give a more simple one because I don't think I've told this story before, but this is kind of a uh, a perfect encapsulation of some of the dumb stuff that you have to deal with. And again, the whole key when you're organizing a convention is that you make it so that someone like you, for instance, who's presenting does not see any of this. Because if you see this, if you can tell that there's a bunch of stuff going on, then it looks stupid. So the more of it that can be hidden, the better. But so a perfect example is that... Um, when I used to work for Six Flags, I was an efficiency specialist. That was like my role there. So I, it's funny, like when you talk to me about stuff, I'm always, I will always come back to like, well, what's the capacity? Like when we're, when we're building arcade boards, it's like, oh, look, a four player arcade board. We want that more than the two player one, because this can have four players of capacity on it. Um, and uh, so <laughs> I will simply say that at one, per, at a location, um, we had an issue where the person who was supposed to be the, the locations person that was supposed to be in charge of capacity and stuff like that, um, clearly knew less about capacity than what I did and was not sharing any information with me. And at one point we were trying to get people into the show 
and there was a bottleneck before this point. I'm being vague because I don't want to overly call out anybody by name because I will also say that I fully understand that this wasn't done on purpose. This wasn't necessarily this person being malicious. This was just this... Per- and I, I, I kind of want to say this was just this person being incompetent, but I don't think that they were actually being incompetent. It's just that they weren't used to operating with a show like what we are. And we as a show really because of our background, because of how long we've done this, we really know a lot of like, we've learned this is how you do this. And this is how you move people. And this is how you do this. And again, I was literally flown around the country for six flags to do this at the different six flags parks. So like I have some real background in moving people. Um, we, uh, he, we were at a point where we could not, we had a huge bottleneck and we couldn't sell people tickets because he wouldn't let people through this bottleneck. And so I had to go to him and just be like, how are we fixing this? And um, it was infuriating me because it took me standing in the middle of the people and sending them up how he had said that he wanted it to be done, but not how he was doing it. And then whenever he would call me and say, oh, you're doing it wrong. I'd be like, nope, this is what you told me and this is what I'm doing. And so it's little stuff like that. And like the key is, is that, you know, if it takes you an extra 10 minutes to get into the show, you probably won't really notice that. But you still want that to be fixed and as smooth as possible because people are going to remember the beginning and the end. And as long as it's moving, it's okay. But the issue that we had at that point was that there was no movement. There was just a keep everybody there. And then we were letting up groups of 10. But the issue that we had was that um, the people that had pre-orders would just leave that side of it empty. And so the big, the big problem was they were not letting us get people out of line that either had pre-orders or who cat who had cash so they could skip the line like they should have. And so, uh, yeah, there, I mean, and there's a million different things like that. There's the time where the tent started raining on the inside of it when we had a tent back at the Brookfield Sheraton. There's the time that my mom, bless her soul, um, she's awesome, by the way. She's, she's you know, she's at home right now, I'm sure, not listening to this. But my mom, um, she... <laughs> And it's my fault, but uh, she was doing pre-orders for us. And I was there, and it should take about five to ten seconds to do a pre-order. You go, beep, hi, here's a wristband, have fun. And so she was going, beep. So it says two tickets. Are there two people here? And they would go, yep. And she would go, okay. So then I'm going to give you two tickets. So how is your day going? And it was like, mom. So we had this issue where the pre-order line was sticking out about 100 feet into the rain. And so the big deal about pre-orders is supposed to be that you get to skip the line and go in quickly. Yeah. Pre-order line sticking out into the rain. The ticketing line where my mom was not at, people were walking in, buying their tickets and going right in. And so it was like, mom. So I got there and I, I mean, again, I cleared this up in a couple of minutes and how angry can I be at the woman? She gave me life, like whatever. I can't be too angry at her. And it's seriously her son that set her up for failure. Um, but so I got there and was just like, all right, here we go. Beep high, beep high, beep high. And like, you know, and it's, it's stuff like that. And the, the other side of it is that a lot of it is anticipating problems before they happen and trying to solve what those problems will be. So you don't have those problems. And, um, that was one of my big failures. That's really funny. I mean, you know, you're right. You got to love your mom, but some, sometimes she's just, they're too chatty. Yep. And that's, you, that's probably I mean, what was happening there. Great. And like, look, most of the time, anywhere else at our show, people want that interaction. They just don't want it when they are stuck not being able to go in the show because my mom, just like Dan Lucen is not the star of the show, my mom is Lynn Lucen. She is also not the star of the show. But what's funny is that there are a number of people that love seeing her. But so now we just are like, okay, cool. We want you to help with this. We just want you to help in a place. Like we usually have her do merchandise pickup, which does not have any type of that thing. So that if people want to come and chat with her for a while, which they do, they get to go do. And she like loves being at the show and she's super helpful. It's just that she doesn't have the, uh, it takes certain people to do ticketing. And like, <laughs> I will share that uh, we, I, I still have friends from the uh, themed entertainment industry and um, the people that run our ticketing now may or may not be executives at Six Flags um, to this day because, again, it's just something where it's like there are certain people that know how to ticket people and there are certain people that, you know, it'll be fine. It's not a big deal. And it's like, no, 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 you don't understand. We pre-sold 5,000 tickets today. If we spend 30 seconds with with each person, that's like 400 hours that we have to spend on ticketing. 
that's a lot of people. We need 50 people doing ticketing then. You can't spend that much. We need to spend three seconds on each person. And that's 9,000 tickets or 9,000 seconds. And then you break. And anyway, I, there's a lot of that math that goes on behind the scenes because, again, um, like seriously, all roads lead back to capacity when you talk with me um, <laughs> about the show. Because once you figure that out, you can figure out how much you want in the way of like, oh, how much is attendance going to be affected? And Friday night, we do limited Friday night. So Friday night is kind of like the Saturday night after party just with regular ticketed people too. And so how many people can we comfortably have in there that are going to be able to have a fun time and stuff like that? And like we're looking at doing this new show um, that we're calling Game Night's Lock-In, which we're hoping if vaccinations still play out that we'll happen in early july um july 2nd through the 4th and like that one is all about us figuring out well how many people can play a game at a time and how many you know we want there not to be a point in time where you're going to walk through the game room and be like oh nothing is available and there's people packed in like sardines so it's like how do we limit that to make the experience what we want it to be and as long as we can do some of that stuff um everything else generally falls into place Right. Yeah. I mean, logistics are everything, especially when you're talking 15,000 plus people. It, it really, really makes a difference. Yeah. Logistics. And I'll also just add expectation setting as long. And like, that's again, where you hear me a lot of the times tell people, like, if we're flexible, you're going to love the show. If you're not flexible, we're going to have problems. And we should talk about it right now if it's a good fit for you, because, you know, and what I also tell people is that and, and it's true. If you're not flexible, that's fine. We can work with you, but it's going to cost you more. Because if you come in saying to me, like, this is exactly what I need, and there's no flexibility built in, I need this type of table, I need this type of chair, I need this type of whatever, I now have to go and I have to rent those things or procure those things or whatever from someone else. And when I do, it's not like those people are coming to me and they're going to be like, oh, yeah, those are nice people. So here they are cheaper. So like, for instance, I had a place a couple of years ago that was 100% set that they had to have a couch, have to have a couch, have to have a couch. We're not coming if we don't have a couch. And I was like, Okay. And so I checked and renting a couch was $600, which is insane because you can buy a couch for about $600. But so I was like, well, here's the deal. You can rent one for 600 or you can bring your own. They were like, well, we don't want to do that. I'm like, well, I don't have spare couches. That, like I can't bring my couch from home and just dump it in your area. So I don't know what you want me to do. And they were like, well, if you don't get us a couch, we're not going to come. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, Thanks. And like the other people who are like, yeah, we'll, we'll work with whatever you got. You got chairs. That's cool. We'll, we'll work with chairs. Okay, cool. I can get you chairs. So. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I mean, every, every person, if, if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You don't, you don't got to make a headache out of it. Um, I guess to wrap everything up, uh, just shout out the social media so that people can find you guys if they're interested in coming to the convention or if they're interested in becoming a part of it, uh, let them know where they can find you. Sure. Um, our biggest, our easiest spot to the our easiest spot to go to is MidwestGamingClassic.com. MidwestGamingClassic.com. Uh, if you are interested in following the show very carefully, scroll down to the bottom of the page below the contact form and click on Join the Mailing List. Joining the mailing list is a great way to get regular updates from us. Um, if you are interested in contact me, scroll to the bottom of any page just above where it says Join the Mailing List, and you can send us a message at any page at the bottom. The messages go straight to me and Gary. So um, if you are going there to write something, like I, I will mention that um, I know that last week we did something on Wednesday where um, Cosmotrons did a presentation on our Twitch channel. And I Yeah, know, I jumped on for that. Yep. And I know that um, the team behind Killer Queen wrote me. And I've seen the email and I haven't gotten back to them yet because I've barely been home. But um, we, we did camping with the kids and stuff like that. It's been, it's been great. But I'm a little bit behind on emails. But I have that email specifically, like it doesn't go through any filters. There's nobody below this. I'm actually full time the show now, which was stupid because that happened right before COVID. So hopefully that keeps working out. But um, it just became that the show is too big to handle without someone doing it full time because it's <laughs> at some point working on it 60 hours a week and holding down a 40 plus hour a week job became uh, cumbersome. So um opted to stop doing that uh, just in time for COVID to uh, make everything a real mess. But it kind of played out okay because it meant that um, I've been able to attempt to apply for grants and deal with a lot of the issues that we've had because none of our systems were set up for canceling the show because we never thought that we'd be doing that. 
Um, so uh, as I've described it, we've been flying a plane that we had to build after we fell out of another um, the whole time. And it's been interesting, but I'm really glad that I wasn't trying to do that while holding out another job because it would be a complete disaster. Anyway, um, you can also find us on Facebook, which is Midwest Gaming Classic dot com. I'm sorry, uh, Midwest Gaming Classic or uh, Facebook backslash Midwest MGC Gaming. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram as Midwest underscore Gaming underscore Classic, and we are on Twitch at TV MGC. Um, and we stream six days a week right now regularly, and we usually have someone stream the seventh. Um, and so, yeah, we, we do a little bit of all of that. And I'll also say, um, with everything that we do, once again, if you have something that you're like, Ooh, I think that I could become part of this and do something, we're open to that. So, um, just using Twitch as another example, uh, I stream right now two nights a week, which is actually more than what I intend to do because we have another show that I think will be coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, otherwise we have volunteers stream the other, there's five more shows that we have. Everybody that streams on another show emailed us or got in touch with someone that already was doing another show and said, hey, I'd like to do a show. And we said, you do? Cool. And um, we basically say, hey, we want you to do one, like a pilot episode that we can look at to make sure that you both fit what we're doing and that we know what your goals are. And as long as it's not like you just sitting there and swearing the whole time, we're going to be like, yeah, cool. And let you have at it. And, um, you know, we, we talk a little bit about some of the different like expectations and stuff like that with people, but, um, it's great because like, there's a couple of people that stream right now. There's three people that stream four. There's 3.5 people. One of them I was friends with, but we hadn't, uh, I mean, Jason, who does the uh, Wednesday night show, um, we just, he does stuff with the show and we just hadn't had that much of a reason to talk. Now Twitch has brought us to the point where we chat like three or four times a week, which is great. Um, and like the other guys, I chat with them a lot more and like, I would be very friendly with them at the show, but this allows me to really have that interaction. And so, um, again, it's all about community. Um, we have a, um, uh, here, I'm going to, I'm going to find it real quick because, um, it's interesting. So yeah, we actually have a mission, which is the Midwest Gaming Classic builds a community for gamers to share and celebrate the love of gaming. And um, that's really what we always try to aim for. Like a lot of mission statements, I feel like with a lot of companies are like, we will become the greatest company at doing what we do that there will ever be. And it's just like, okay, but ours is actually like, it's what we really try to do every day is, okay, how can we do this? How can we change this? How can we make this better? And how can we get the community involved with it? Because again, the Midwest Gaming Classic only works with the community being what the community is. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, the mission statement is achievable and you guys shoot for it every single time. And it seems like you nail it, in my opinion, personally. Well, thank you. And I mean, like I said, that's really important to us because it's not just a line that I use, but you are a much more important person to the Midwest Gaming Classic um, than in the way of bringing people out to the show than I ultimately am. I am important in the way of um, organizing it. And I. some people have said, like, you, you can't downplay yourself. If without you, it doesn't work. And I get that. But it's just as much that without you, nobody would come to the show. If everybody who brought stuff said, I'm not going to come to the show anymore. Um, at this point, we will have a better backbone of stuff. We'll have about 30 games of each type there, about 30 pinball machines, about 30 arcade games, about 30 consoles. And that will be it. And that is not a show that 15,000 people are going to show up for. So um, it is clearly you guys that make the show. It is, again, again, it really goes as far as, like, some shows get all cocky and they're like, well, you know, if you're just buying a ticket, you're not doing anything to make the show better. And I'm like, yeah, right. Those are the people that fund the show to make it work. If you buy a ticket, you are just as important to making the show happen than someone who, you know, you know than me, quite frankly. I don't buy a ticket for the show. I, news break. You spend the um, money. Yeah. So I, <laughs> exactly. I spend a lot of money. <laughs> um, and so like, I, I, we need to make sure that there's people that are willing to pay for it. If, if everybody is not willing to pay for it anymore, we don't have a show. So um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's everything on this end. Um, I'm going to throw those links down in the description so that everybody can find them. Um, I really appreciate you coming on here, Dan. I'm sure we're going to do this again once we get closer to the actual show. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, guests that you've announced and things like that. But for anybody yeah. listening that's enjoyed the show and wants to support Indie Arcade Wave, you can uh, check out our podcast um, or our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Um, and we'll be back next Friday with an ep another episode. But until then, peace. <laughs>